All right, keep your Bibles open there in 2 Chronicles 18. And please also, keep your finger there, but please also go to Ephesians chapter 6. Go to Ephesians chapter 6 once again. And I am continuing our series on the whole armor of God. And uh, I wanted to get to a story of a battle, right? Because we're talking about putting on the armor. You know, we're involved in this spiritual battle, not a physical fight. But there's a lot of great battles. There's a lot of great uh, stories in the Old Testament that help illustrate a truth, right? Help illustrate a spiritual truth. Please go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 13. It says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins good about with truth, so we've covered that, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, we've covered that, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, we've covered that. Now look at verse number 16. This is what we're focused on today. It says, Above all, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And so when we're looking at the armor of God, all of it's important, right? God wants us to put the whole thing on, not to leave out any pieces in our, in our spiritual warfare. But it says here very clearly in verse number 16, above all. You know what that means? Most important. When it comes to all these things, they're all important. But what is above all of that is to have the shield of faith. Why is the shield of faith important? It says, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. This is why it's important, okay? Because when the devil attacks us, when this world attacks us, it's that faith, it's that shield of faith that will protect us from the attacks of the wicked. All right? So this is above all. We must make sure. Yeah, you can have all the armor on, but forget the shield of faith. Well, you're going to be hit by those arrows. You're going to be hit by those fiery darts, okay? So we need the shield of faith. Now, let's go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 18. 2 Chronicles chapter 18 and verse number 29. Let's uh, find this story here in the Old Testament. A very famous story, a lot of great teachings in it, but I want to tie it in here with the armor of God. All right? Look at verse number 29. So, quick summary of the story. We have King Jehoshaphat, all right, of, Ju of, of Judah. You know, he's a godly king. He's trying to please the Lord. He's also, you know, reaching out as a friend to the northern king, Ahab, right? But uh, bad decision. You know, there are some friends you should just avoid. or well, some people you should just avoid, right? He's trying to bring this allegiance, trying to be a friend to this other king. And this other king encourages Jehoshaphat to get involved in, in a war with Syria, all right? And now uh, King uh, Ahab has all these, um, has all these uh, false prophets, right? They have, he has all these teachers of the law that will tell him what he wants to hear. Right? But Jehoshaphat wants to hear from a true man of God. Right? He's a godly man. He wants to make sure before I go to war that I have God on my side. That God is telling me it's time to fight this battle. Right? So we have two men. Right? One who's seeking God and one who's just, you know, just doing his own thing. Right? Doing his own thing. And then you know, eventually they find one man, uh, who, one, one prophet, who says, look, God is not with you here. You go there, you know, king, and, and you're going to die, basically. Right? Anyway, for whatever reason, it doesn't stop these two to go to war. Well, I know the reason why, right? For King Ahab, for him, he just had no faith. He did not believe the word of God. He did not believe the prophet of God, right? And what are we teaching on today? We're teaching on the shield of faith, right? Having faith is to trust what God has said is true and to believe in that, right? To carry that through and say, God, you have said this. I'm going to have faith that this is true. Both these men lacked in faith. Okay, they both went to war. At least Jehoshaphat was trying to do what is right, trying to do what is godly. He even finds himself in a difficult situation here. But look at verse number 29. It says, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle, but put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went to the battle. All right. So we're talking about putting on the whole armor of God. What do we find? Find one king that says, look, I'm not going to put on my kingly robes. I'm not going to present myself as the king, right? But he says to the, to the godly king, hey, you put on your robes though. You dress up for the battle, right? And of course, he's trying to hide himself from the enemy. So if the enemy goes toward the king, wants to kill the king, it's going to kill Jehoshaphat, even though it wasn't his idea to go to war, right? But Jehoshaphat, hey, he does what's right. He puts on his kingly robes. You know, he, he presents himself as a chief, you know, a commander in chief in the army here. And then let's keep reading there in verse number 30. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight ye not with small or great, save only the king of Israel. So that's the tactics here, right? 
Don't, don't worry about defeating the whole army. We're just going after the king. We're going for the head. We take him down. We take down the whole army. That's their tactics, right? And so Jehoshaphat is the one that looks, like, that looks kingly, right? Verse number 31, And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, and that they said, it is the king of Israel, though he wasn't the king of Israel, he was the king of Judah, all right? Therefore they come past about him to fight, but Jehoshaphat cried out. Now who did he cry out to? It's quite clear that he cries out to God, right? He finds himself in a battle. He finds himself about to be defeated. All these, these soldiers are coming to fight him. He cries out to the Lord, it says here, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. So I don't know exactly what happens, but somehow God, I guess, confuses these soldiers, and they don't go and attack him, right? He cries out. He cries out to God, right? And this is, you know, where we see the, the, his faith step in, right? Because he didn't have the faith. He should have listened to uh, Micaiah. He said, don't go to war. He should have done that. He didn't have the faith. Right now, though, he has the faith, right? He's calling out to God, God, help me. And God steps in and helps him. Look at verse number 32. Uh, Oh, sorry, verse number 33. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture. What that means is, that there's a guy with a bow and arrow, and at a venture basically means uh, just takes the risk. Just, 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 he just, this, just you know, fires. You know, he doesn't really aim at anything. He just fires his arrow, right? Just a random shot you know, from, from one, of the, one of the enemies, right? He draws a bow at a venture and smotes the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Not only that he get, does he get the king of Israel, but between the heart, like, you know, where, where, where it's weak in the armor, right? Somehow that arrow just finds the weak spot in the armor and he gets the king of, of Israel there. And then it says, Therefore he said to his chariot man, Turn thine hand, that thou mayest carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the even. And about the time of the sun going down, he died. All right. So this king, king of Israel, wicked king, no faith in God, not trust in the works of God, right? He doesn't put on his, his uh, battle armor, you know, he doesn't put on his, his kingly robes. He doesn't stand out. He tries to hide. He's lacking the faith. And guess what happens? He gets hit by just a random arrow, all right? What did we learn about the shield of faith? That it protects us. It quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, brethren, here's the thing about Satan, all right? Yes, the devils may know certain temptations, certain difficulties you may have in your life because they have, have had success on you already. You know, they might have brought in some temptation, some sin that you've fallen over, right? Maybe, maybe they've done something to cause you not to live godly. But you know, many times they're just going to shoot all arrows at you. They're just going to shoot indiscriminately, right? It's just going to go flying. And if you haven't got your shield of faith, it's going to hit where it's weak, right? That's what the devil does. He hits you with everything, right? You, you, there are some sins, there are some things that you don't struggle with, but the devil's just going to throw it your way. He's hoping something will stick, and he'll throw something else. He'll throw another, another, another arrow at you, another arrow at you, right? It's a spiritual war. We need to make sure we have the whole armor of God. We must make sure we have the shield of faith. You know, if we haven't got that shield of faith, brethren, if we don't live in accordance to God's word and trust what he says, one of those arrows, one of those fiery darts will get you. You know, will get you and, you know, take you down in your spiritual life. And yet we have the other king. At that one moment, he cries out to God in faith. God comes and delivers him. He had the shield of faith, right? And hey, he wasn't ashamed of going with his kingly robes. He was ready to go and fight even though he hadn't uh, done correctly at the beginning. But he eventually gets that shield of faith and he finds himself protected. Protected from the enemy. Okay? So there's a great story there. A great story, a great illustration of this spiritual truth. And brethren, let me just tell you, Satan's going to shoot every arrow he can at you, all right? Every arrow. You turn on the TV, there's probably going to be a hundred arrows going your way. Some of those things, you're probably like, just, ah, that doesn't bother me. You know, you might see some, I don't know, you might see uh, a commercial on, on alcohol or uh, some other, you know, ungodly device that, might, uh, that some people struggle with. You may not struggle with some of that. But then on the television, they might find, they might show you a woman that's not dressed well, not dressed modestly. Right, and that might you might end up struggling with that. All right, I mean the devil's just going to throw everything at you, everything at you, and you need to be prepared. Don't think you can go to this battle without the shield of faith. You must have it on. It says above all, taking the shield of faith. Okay. Now please go to Hebrews chapter eleven. We have to go to Hebrews chapter eleven whenever we're teaching on, on on the topic of faith. Right? What's a chapter of faith? Hebrews chapter eleven for sure. Right? You guys go to Hebrews chapter eleven, and I'm going to read to you 
from Matthew 17. Matthew 17. You just get ready in Hebrews 11. But Matthew 17, verse 18, we have the story here of Jesus rebuking a devil. Matthew 17, verse 18 reads, And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. Okay. So the devils could not cast out, sorry, the devils, did I say devils? The disciples could not cast out a devil, right? Because, Jesus makes it very clear, because of your unbelief, you will lack in faith. And then he says this, For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, are these words true? Did Jesus say these words? That if we just have faith like a mustard seed, a small seed, a small amount of faith, we can accomplish great things. That's what God says. We just need a small amount of faith and we can accomplish great things. Listen, when you first place your faith on Jesus Christ, you accomplish a great thing. You were saved, right? You believe the gospel. You believe Jesus Christ. You trusted in His sacrifice. Just faith alone. And now you're on your way to heaven. Hey, that shows you that a little bit of faith can accomplish a great amount of things, right? Amount, a great amount of works, right? You can do great things for God. But here's the thing. Now that you are saved, we're commanded to live by faith, right? We're commanded to walk by faith. And so God wants us to accomplish great works for Him. You know, again, we're in a warfare, brethren. We're in the fight. And that faith, that shield of faith is going to protect you from the evil one. So you can go forward and cause some damage to the spiritual kingdom of Satan, right? So you can get there and, you know, prove yourself. Show God's power through your life. But look, without faith, you're not going to do great works. Without faith, you're not going to do anything for the Lord. It all starts with faith. Now, what is faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. Hebrews 11, verse number 1. The Bible is very clear. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Number one, biblical faith, Christian faith, is not an empty or blind faith. It's not blind. It says it is the substance of things hoped for. Okay? We don't just believe whatever we're told. It's built upon something. Okay? It is built on something that is substantial. That's where substance comes from. Say, what is it built on? Right here, this book. Okay, we, we read these words, we see this book, this is what we need to trust, believe, place our faith on. It's not built on nothingness, okay? It's built on something and our faith is, uh, has substance, right? It says the evidence of things not seen, all right? Have you seen God? Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen heaven or hell? Yet, I'm sure if I ask any of you guys, you're going to tell me I know it's true, 100%. Just as much as I know my name is Kevin, just as much as I know I have 11 kids, just as much as I know that I live, you know, in Baringa, all right, just as much as I know anything in this reality, I know Jesus Christ. I know He's real. I know He died for me. I know He's prepared a place for me in heaven. Just as much. It's not like I have less trust in that. I believe in that just as much. And I'm sure if I ask you, you'll be saying the same thing to me, okay? Because that's what faith does. It's the evidence of things not seen. I know there's an eternity. Why, I want, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not looking to waste my time on a Wednesday night. You know, if we don't believe these things, if we don't believe in a spiritual world, we don't believe in, etern- in, in eternity, in heaven or hell, why are we here then if we don't believe those things? The fact that you're here listening to me, right, listening to some guy talk for 40 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour, proves to me that you have evidence of those things and that evidence is your faith. That's why we're here, to listen to the Word of God. Look at verse number 2. For by it, by its faith that is, the elders obtained a good report. Okay? A good report. So a good report is the outcome of faith. Okay? So I hope you're living for the Lord. I hope you're doing great things with your life. I hope, you know, you're becoming a better husband, a better father, better children as you grow in faith for the Lord. I hope there's a good report about your life. It should be. If you have the faith, if you believe the Word of God, what should it, it should produce is a good report, okay? The fact that you're doing good works. Verse number uh, 3, look at verse number 3. 
It says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word, word of God. Hey, is that what our, our scientists teach? That the worlds were framed by the word, word, uh, word of God? They don't teach that. You know why? Because they don't have faith in God. They haven't got faith in the Word of God. And yet, you ask me, you know, are you, how, did, how was the world created? I can tell you exactly. Just over 6,000 years ago. Some 6,100, maybe was it 200 years, right? I can't remember what I worked out, right? You know, it took God six days. And all he had to do was say a few things. Let there be light. And there was light, the Bible says, right? I know that. And yet these scientists who get the big paychecks in universities, they dedicate their whole lives for this. And they're wrong. They're lying. (laughs) They're deceived and they don't even know it. But they're deceived, you know. And they think they're doing good. But no, that's not a good report before the Lord. That's not a good report. And then it says, so so that uh, things which are seen, that's everything that we see in this world, right? I can see you. I can see the chairs. I can see the carpet. I can see the building. I can see the sun and and the ocean. And I can see the grass and the trees. It says here, so the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. What in the world? You know, everything is built on things you can't see, things that do not appear. You know, it's the atom. You know, the atom cannot be seen by the naked eye. Okay? The atom, you you need a very powerful uh, microscope to be able to see uh, the smallest atom. It's impossible with the naked eye, and yet God knew about that. God knew that the things that he built, you know, are uh, are from... uh, built from things that cannot be seen. I mean, this is, this is what faith is, right? The fact that we have this evidence, we have this substance of our faith, okay? It's real, okay? It gives us a good report, but it's built on something that many people cannot see. But I know it's there. I know I, know I have faith. I know you have faith, right? I know that. It's right there. And you know what? The atom is not the smallest particle. You know, the atom is made up of small particles, right? There are subatomic particles that make up the atom, you know, the electrons, the uh, protons, and the neutrons. And you know what? Those particles cannot be seen. There is no microscope that can see those things. It's never been seen by a human being. But what, what they have seen are the effects of those particles. They don't see the particles, but they see the effects of those particles. They know it's out there, okay? They can't really find them because they're so tiny, but they know they're there, all right? And you know what they say about these particles? They say that it, well, there's, there's sort of debate amongst the scientific community if these particles are actually made of matter or just energy. Imagine it's not even made of matter, and yet we have all this matter made up from things that contain no matter. Well, that sounds like what we just read there in Hebrews chapter 11, all right? It's amazing, you know? This is the creation of God. But why do I know? I didn't, I didn't need the scientists to tell me this. I know because of my faith on the Word of God that this is how He's created things. That the, everything that we see is bu- made of things that we cannot see. Things that do not appear. Drop down to verse number 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. It says, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So we want to please God. What do we need? We need faith, right? When we have faith, we please Him. When you place your faith on Jesus Christ, it pleases the Lord. Whenever you place your faith on God for your, your daily life, it pleases the Lord. And when you lack faith, it displeases the Lord, okay? It says here, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So brethren, I know, Number one, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. I know you believe that already. Okay, I know that. But then that's not it. And this is what else we have to believe. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Brethren, this is what pleases the the Lord. Number one, that you know that he is. And number two, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, this is what our faith ought to be based on. You know, and this is why it's, it's uh, easy you know, to, to build faith is because when you find yourself living in faith, you're going to find that God's going to start rewarding you. You're going to find that God starts to bless you. Okay? And when you can uh, see those things, it's much easier to have greater faith for some greater task, so, so from some greater hope that you may have in the future. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. 
hey, there's an effect for your faith, right? Every, what's it saying? Every uh, uh, action has a reaction, okay? What does God want from us? He wants us to seek, we seek, and we'll find, all right? We knock, and it'll be opened unto us, right? And uh, ask, and it'll be given to you. Ask, and it'll be given to you, right? That's faith. When you go to the Lord in prayer, and you ask, well, the Lord's going to answer that prayer for you, okay? And so when we read there in, in Hebrews eleven six, and it is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him, we seek Him in faith, brethren. That's how we seek Him. We seek Him in faith, and He's going to reward that faith. Boy, I want to be rewarded by God. I know you want to be rewarded by God. I know we've already been rewarded by God because of our faith, right? When I think about New Life Baptist Church, and I think about, is the Lord's hand in this church? Absolutely. So how do you know? Because He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Because we've gone in faith, we've stepped out in faith, and, the God, and God has provided. God has blessed. You know, I never forget the day I was in Sydney. You know, we set, we're going to start the church 1st of October, no matter what. You know, we were struggling to find a building, struggling to find a house for my family. Eventually, we got the building. I got to a point where I was going to say, you know what, if I can't find a house, I'm willing to fly down every Sunday out of my own pocket just to have church here and fly back. That's what we're going to do. You know what? Seven days, literally, or six days before we started church, the house is available. We found a house. Say, why? Because we had faith. We stepped out in faith. We say, God, we're going to start New Life Baptist Church. And we're going to start it on the 1st of October. And Lord, we're doing your work. We're doing your will. We're striving to serve you, to do your work. And God says, well, let me reward your faith. <laughs> All right? Let me test it out a little bit. And, you know, just a week before church, we'll find you a house. Okay? Found the building. Praise God, you know, the Lord uh, rewards. And actually, it was the only building that we got. I know it was a bit difficult there at the, at the rugby club, but it was the only one that actually allowed us to meet on Sunday morning. Like, I had contacted every other building, and I already had set my mind and my heart that we're going to start the church in Caloundra, right? We called it the church in Caloundra, right? And yet, there was that one building left, the only one that was left, you know, with morning services for Sunday. Praise God for His provisions, all right? And then what about this new building now that we have here? How did that come to be, brethren? Well, we are praying for it, remember? We are praying for it, we are praying for it, we are praying for God to find us something where we can have two services on a Sunday, make it easier, something that was affordable as well for us. And then this building came available. You know, Brother Matthew mentioned it. You know, it took several months, but eventually the, the previous pastor, the Pentecostal pastor, contacted me and said, look, do you want to carry on this lease? We need, we're trying to find a church to take over this building. Praise God. And you know what? We worked at the finances and we found out that if we pay the lease, we're going to be left with $50 a month. That's all. It's like we have the building and we'll be left with $50, you know, for water or whatever, right? <laughs> Drink a bit of water. I don't know. Or tracks, you know, be used up by tracks, right? And yet we stepped out in faith, brethren, right? We stepped out in faith. And yeah, the first couple of months was tight. And then we had people added to the church. The offerings went up. And guess what? Now, we, we pay it easily. In fact, we're a month ahead in our payments for the lease. Praise God. You know, we stepped out in faith, and He rewarded our church. You know, so many things. So many things. Actually, the pulpit. This pulpit. I don't know if you guys remember, but our last service at, at we were, uh, before we came here was at Kiwana Forest uh, Community Center. It was a Friday. We had a Friday, and I remember, we had Friday services sometimes, right? We had a Friday service there, and then we were coming into this building on the Sunday. We did not have a pulpit, right? And then Brother Stephen, all right? We contact Brother Stephen, and on Saturday, he comes and delivers it for us. Amen. Just in time. You go and check the YouTube channel. The first meeting that we have here is with this pulpit. We had literally two days from our last service at that community center, and the Lord delivered it, right? He, we stepped out in faith, and he goes, all right, there's the pulpit for you as well. Not just a building. You know, the Lord just keeps providing. And listen, we've been praying for air conditioning, right? We had the air conditioners break down during summer. We struggled, all right? It was difficult. I found it hard to preach in the heat and all that kind of stuff, right? It was really uncomfortable. Hey, I had the air conditioning guy, technician, come out today to give me a quote, right? And you know why I caught him out today? Because I actually I caught him out before. I caught him out early in the year. And I said to him, you know, to, to, you know he, he gave me some advice. And I said, well, how much is that going to cost me? You know, and, and when's the cheapest to get that installed? When, when would it be the cheapest to contact you? And he says, well, you know, June, July, 
that's where, where you know, business starts to die down a little bit. You contact me in June and July, and it's going to be this much. It's going to be some uh, six to 7,000, he told me. It's going to be this much. And if you can call me then, I'll give you a discount as well and all this kind of stuff. Guess what? Now we're in June. We're approaching July. Guess how much money we have in the bank account? Just over $7,000. We've never had that much money in our bank account. You know why? Because we prayed about it. We've sought the Lord in faith. And he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. Amen. Listen, this church has been built on faith. And I know it's been built on Jesus Christ. That's why. It's not built on the efforts of man. It's not built on personality. It's built on Jesus Christ. Okay? Blessed Hope Baptist Church. When we started that church down there, all right, we just stepped out in faith with the families down there. All I need, I said, look, I'll come down, you know, midweek services in Sydney as long as the offerings can afford the plane tickets. I don't need to get paid. As long as the plane tickets are covered and we find a place to meet, guess what? Immediately, enough, just enough to, to pay the plane, uh, plane tickets. And guess what? A building free of charge. We used it for over a year free of charge. Amen. God provided, right? And then we had to move out of that building. And we found another building, praise God, in less than a week. It was fine. And then we were told we have to leave that building because of these restrictions. And we're panicking. We owe like three days to church. We find a building. And the building didn't have electricity. So on Sunday, they're having service without electricity. That's fine because it's during the morning. But then we needed it by Tuesday night. You know, Tuesday night service. You need lights, right? <laughs> you need lights. Guess what? Two hours before church service, the electrician comes in and connects the electricity. You know what that is? That's faith. You know, and I'm like, man, are we going to, I'm like, I'm ready to contact everyone. Listen, don't come to church today because the electricity is not, no, the guy, you know, literally. And I contact the company that said they normally come in the mornings. He's probably not going to turn up today. I'm like, oh man, it's not going to work out. Literally two hours before church service, they connect it. You know, why? Because we stepped out in faith. You know, both, I can see the Lord's hand in both churches. And listen, <sighs> go to Psalm 20, go to Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. And look, I'm just talking about the church because we're all involved in the church. I'm sure you can relate in your own personal life how you've stepped out in faith and God has provided. How you had that shield of faith and it's protected you from the fiery darts of the wicked. Go to Psalm chapter 20 and verse number 7. And I think it's better for us when we started this church, we started from scratch and we built ourselves up slowly, slowly. You know, increase our faith slowly. You know, we exercise our faith slowly. I think it's much better having started our church this way than having everything handed to us from the very beginning. Because then we wouldn't have that faith. We wouldn't be growing in faith. We wouldn't see how God's hand has provided for us. And, you know, it's, it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous. And we've got to be careful of this because we're going to get the air con units. We're going to be doing really well financially. We've got a building, praise God. We've got a lot of things going for us right now, right? But what we don't want is to turn our hearts toward those resources or towards those finances and, and, and start putting our trust upon those things. When the whole time our trust has been in God and then God has provided those things. The mistake happens when you start to get more and more things and you think, wow, look at our church and look at all the things that we have. Don't worry about the things that we have. Praise God for them, but make sure that you put your heart and trust and faith on Jesus Christ, not on the things, not on the resources that we have. Psalm chapter 20 and verse number 7. Remember, we're in a spiritual warfare here. Psalm chapter 20 and verse number 7. It says, some trust in chariots. Well, they're going to war. That's good, right? They should trust in their, in their chariots. Well, should they? Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Listen, when we go to war, we don't trust in our resources. We don't trust in our possessions or in our bank account. We don't trust these things for church. We need to place our trust. Remember the name of the Lord, our God. Verse number eight, they are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Hey, why does New Life Baptist Church stand upright right now? It's because we've trusted in the Lord. We've remembered the name of the Lord. We did not boast in our resources. We did not boast in these other things. We've only boasted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not forget, you know, no matter how much this church grows, no, never forget that our faith must rest solely on the Lord our God. Please go to James chapter 2. Go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. <clears throat> how do I know if I am exercising my faith? How do I know this? Well, I think James chapter 2 does a really good job of uh, illustrating or teaching on this. And sometimes we turn to James chapter 2, 
and we focus on debating those that believe in work salvation, right? But, you know, we can miss the point of the book as well, if, if, if that's what we're focused on. But in James chapter 2, verse number 17, let's have a look at this. James chapter 2, verse number 17, it says, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So, brethren, you have faith, I know, okay? But if you don't have works, that faith is dead. It's alone. It's alone. Okay. Now, this is, you know, this is actually not even about salvation. This is not about the salvation of your soul. What this is teaching is, we are people of faith. We are striving to live by faith. Well, if, if, if that's what we're striving to do, then we need some works to go with our faith. All right? Otherwise, our faith is dead. It's not good for anything. It's not productive for anything. Right? It's just, yeah, we've got the faith, but we're not, we're not exercising that faith. We're not using that faith and stepping out in faith and saying, God, help me to exercise. Help me to do something productive with the faith that I have. Look at verse number 18. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, first of all, those that believe you must have works to have true faith. Well, this, this says in verse number 18, show me thy faith without thy works. So can you show your faith without works? Absolutely. Okay. In fact, that's what salvation is, salvation of the soul. And this isn't even about the salvation of the soul. But that's what it is, right? That you place your faith without works, without trusting any works. You place your faith alone on Jesus Christ. And listen, now that you are children of faith, well, what's the, what should we do? It says, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So should we do works? Absolutely. Should we serve God? Should we serve one another? Should we serve the body of Christ? Absolutely, we should all do that, right? If you have the faith, show your faith by your works, you know? This is why, you know, our faith is so important because without faith, we can't do the works and we can't please God, all right? We want to be people that please the Lord God. Look at verse number 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. <clears throat> but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? All right, so... Live in faith, not dead faith, but live in faith ought to drive you to serve God. It ought to drive you to do good works. It ought to drive you to serve the local New Testament church. And of course, you know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we love that. So true. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen, right? Not of works. We're saved by faith. But then verse number 10 for we are his workmanship unto good works, which God have before ordained that we should walk in them. So if we're people of faith, what should we do now? Get some works, right? Exercise that faith. Do something productive for the Lord. And here's the thing, brethren. You have that faith and you can do great things. He's going to reward you. He's going to give you the ability to do things for the Lord. Please go to uh, Mark chapter 9. Go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. <clears throat> Mark chapter 9. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Luke 17 verse 3. Because maybe you're lacking faith tonight. I have to admit that there's been many times in my life that I've lacked faith. Okay? And in Luke 17 verse 3, it says, Take heed to yourselves. These are the words of Jesus. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> increase our faith. If someone does wrong to you, offends you, hurts you, it's hard enough to forgive them the first time. Jesus says, look, if they do it seven times in a day, forgive them. And so the apostles are like, oh man, I can't do it. They're lacking faith, right? And they're asking the Lord Jesus Christ, increase our faith. And brethren, we need our faith increased. Okay? I, I, I don't think I could forgive someone seven times in one day who wronged me. I, I, hope, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I just, I can't, you know, I can't even imagine that, right, happening, right? It's hard enough just once. I think after the second time, I'm like, I'm done with you. <laughs> but that's a lack of faith, right? You guys are in Mark 9, verse 17. Mark 9. Verse 17, it says, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which have a dumb spirit. And whether so he taketh him, he teareth him, 
and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pinneth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. So this is actually the same story that we started off with as well, but just from the book of Mark. It says here, He answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straight away the spirit tear at him, and he fell on the ground and wallowing foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. So of a child, since a little child, this uh, uh, young man has been possessed by this devil. Verse number 22. And oft times it have cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Wow. Do you believe that, brethren? Do you believe that? If thou canst, if you can believe Jesus, that you can do anything. All right. Look at verse 24. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Okay. So he said, Look, I believe, Lord, that you can help him, but. I've got some doubts. Help me. Help my unbelief. And so, brethren, if you find yourself lacking faith, if you find yourself not having, you know, uh, lacking in, in belief, you know, realizing that you're not accomplishing great things for God, and when you look at it, maybe it's because you don't have the faith. Maybe you don't have that shield of faith. Maybe the devil has attacked you like this young man has been attacked by. Maybe if his father had a greater faith, the devil would not have been able to get those fiery darts into his family. That's a possibility, right? And so the question is then, how do we increase our faith? Well, we see number one, we go to Jesus. We ask, we ask Jesus, right? The apostles did it. The father of his son went to Jesus, please help our faith. So we go to God, number one, to help increase our faith. But I believe, you know, just some practical things that we can do to increase our faith. Please go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, remember Hebrews chapter 11 is the, the, the chapter, the, the faith chapter, right? The chapter on faith, right? Hebrews chapter 11 uh, but leading into Hebrews chapter 11 is Hebrews chapter 10, of course. And so we're going to look at the, toward the end of Hebrews chapter 10 because this helps us understand how we can be people that grow in faith, that we can add to our faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 30, not 38. Let me just show you this. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 38. It says, Now the just shall live by faith, and if any man draw back, my soul ha shall have no pleasure in him. So how is it that we please the Lord again? With our faith, right? So if you draw back, if you haven't got, you're not living by faith, you're not walking by faith, then you're not going to please Him. That's why God says here, my soul shall have no pleasure in Him. So that ties in together, right? So we see definitely that this is about having faith. So let's backtrack a little bit. Let's get a bit of context. Let's go to verse number 35. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 35. And here we'll see four things. Four things that will help you exercise or increase your faith. Look at verse number 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Is it possible to cast off your confidence? Yeah. So the Apostle Paul is saying, look, don't cast it away. Okay, what is confidence? Something that you trust in, right? Don't cast it away. He says, stay confident. Be confident that God is true to His Word. Be confident that God is true to His promises. I know if I go to prayer to God in the Holy Spirit, that he's going to hear my prayers and he's going to answer my prayers. Do you believe that, brethren? I hope you believe that. Have the confidence in that. When you go to pray, have confidence. Have faith when you go to pray that God will hear you. That's number one. Have confidence. Don't, don't put it aside. Okay? Don't put it away. Number one, have confidence in God and in his word. Number two, it says, which have great recompense of reward. Now, we saw that already. If we have faith, God will reward us. Right? So point number two is keep your eyes open. On the reward. Listen, it's coming. You know, you have the confidence. Yes, God's going to hear me. God knows. I have faith in God. And the promise is, He's going to reward that faith. So hold on to that promise. Hold on to that reward. Keep your eyes on the reward. You know, it's coming. Now look, it can take time. It can take even a long time. Because look at verse number 36. For ye have need of patience. <laughs> Alright, number three. Be patient. Alright? Sometimes, yeah, God's going to just allow you to go uh, longer than you maybe feel you, you need to. Maybe you want God to answer that prayer today. Maybe you want God to keep that promise right now for you. But it's something that is still further down the track, right? Hey, we need to have patience. 
Okay, that's, that's how we do it, right? We need to learn how to have patience in our spiritual life. And not only that, it says, For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So what's the next thing? Number four, do the will of God, right? Do the will of God. Listen, faith is not this. This is not faith. I'm just going to do whatever I want, right? I'm just going to live however I want, and God will take care of me because He promised that He's going to take care of me. God promised that He'll never leave me nor forsake me, so I'm just going to just live a miserable, wicked life. Listen, I'm not going to go to work. I'm not going to provide for my family. I'm just going to play video games all day. Hey, that's not faith, okay? That's not doing the will of God. What are we commanded to do? Do the will of God, right? That you might receive the promise. Verse number 37, For yet a little while that he shall come, and sorry, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So what's the commandment then, brethren? We are to live by faith. We are to walk by faith. And once again, guys, we need to increase our faith. Yes, go to Jesus. Go to God. Ask him to increase your faith. But what can we do? Let me just put those four things once again from what we read there. Have confidence in God and his word. Number two, keep your eyes on the reward. It'll keep you motivated, right? Number three, be patient. Be patient. And number four, do the will of God. Okay, do the will of God. If you do God's will, guess what? He's going to come and reward that faith. You know, how do I know God's will? Read this book and just do what he says. It's not that complicated. It's like, oh, it's God's will in my life, for my life. Just read the Bible. It's all here. You're a man. Go to work. Find a wife. Have kids. All right, you're, you're a lady, get married, have kids, raise your children, love the Lord, go to church, go soul winning, pray, you know, confess your sins to the Lord, right? I mean, it, it's not, comp- the Christian life is not complicated. I tell you what, the world, the unbelievers, if they've got a complicated life, you know, they don't know what to, they don't know, you know, what to do with their lives. They don't know what the future holds. I know what the future holds. I know exactly what the future holds, you know? Say, oh man, it's, the w- governments are getting so wicked these days, right? Uh, yeah, I know, we know that. <laughs> Didn't you read Revelation? <laughs> Didn't you read the book of Psalms? It's all over the Bible, right? This wicked, I'm not surprised anymore because I've got faith in God's word. I know it's all going to come true. All right, so above all, brethren, above all, don't forget, this is the most important part of your armor. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Let's pray.